as part of the international art conclave by the Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy, we have John Rupert, who is a sculptor and artist here from the USA to be part of the conclave. John would be sharing his works, his experiences as an artist and also his journey as a sculptor with us today. Welcome to uh, the Academy, John, well, and welcome you. to India. I well, suppose this you. is your first time here in India? First time. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And are you familiar a bit about uh, the country and its... Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've always wanted to come here. Okay. And, uh, I've been uh, interested in the Far East and the cultures of the Far East. So this is... I've been to China several times and so uh, India wa is on my list so this is a great opportunity to come here. Welcome. Yeah. So tell us a little about yourself John first. First things first, you're a sculptor, you work a lot, lot with industrial materials and um, so where, where, do you, where does John come from and how did uh, the journey as an artist begin for you? Well I think it actually started when I was around 12. 11 years old, 11, 12 years old. Um, my parents were in the USAID program, so we lived in the Middle East in Jordan. Okay. And as a child, I got involved with archaeology. And uh, we went out on trips out in the desert. And, you know, at the time, I didn't, I loved it. It was two years, a very intense two years of being in the desert and experiencing uh, architecture that had been built from the land and then reclaimed from the land. So this idea of, of ruin having this kind of human order and natural order together. Now as a kid, I, I was, wasn't processing that, but I think later on that became a big influence in how I perceive things and work with materials. Um, so process and the element of time are major parts of my work. With the uh, industrial materials, there's this investigation in the, uh, the nature in industry. So I see the uh, casting process as a metaphor to volcanic activity. So the idea that um, we are sitting on a globe with molten material under our feet, and every once in a while it shoots <laughs> up. Um, I just think it's very primal and, and, and uh, I use that as a metaphor for the casting process mm. and I, as industry. And um, the vari various images that have evolved have been through uh, observation of nature and, and objects that have been affected by natural events. So I've worked on a, a series of lightning strikes where I collect shards of trees that have been hit by lightning and then cast them in metal. Okay. Um, and the idea is that the metal also is a conduit of electricity. So the, there's this whole cycle of materiality, the uh, event, and the frozen moment, mm -hmm. like when lightning strikes, and also with the liquid metal, uh, it freezes, you know, like a fossil almost. So there's a lot of metaf natural metaphor with, while I'm working with the industrial very interesting. Stuff. And how did uh, art happen? You said archaeology was uh, a form of art that you discovered early on in life. And well, how did it translate into? Well, I guess with archaeology, you know, you're looking at a lot of art and objects made by humans from another time and other, other civilization, and you're looking at fragments, too. So you have to imagine what the rest was like. True. And so I think that's part of the creative process and thinking and kind of imagining beyond what's there. And sometimes it's what's not there that's more interesting <laughs> than what's there. Um, but then I got involved with, you know, uh, art in high school and then went on to, uh, in fact, I thought I might become an architect and went into pre-architecture, but I found the architecture that was too confining for me and uh, then went into just began making art. And sculpture came first to you or did painting happen uh, first, um, which usually happens uh, in art schools? I think I've always made things. I mean, as, a, as a kid I made 
of a go-kart and a hydroplane and, I've, and I, my father was an engineer so I've always been interested in how things are made. So I think as a sculptor I've always been interested in material and building. Now my mother was a painter okay. and so uh, I do have an interest in color and, and um, in fact part of my work is photography and I do composite images that are built so it's not just a, uh, an image uh, taken once with a camera, but when I look at a situation, I build the image through what I'm looking at, and then those images are then stitched together okay. into a larger ob object. Um, they're very sculptural okay. photo photographs. The photographs <laughs> yeah. as well. Okay. They feel there's a materiality to the photographs, mm -hmm. usually as well, but also an interest in the color and, and what's found in nature. And, and in some cases, um, I'll take, I'll um, harvest a color that's in the photograph and take an area of, of the photograph and make it a plain color in contrast with the natural setup. Right, right, interesting. And uh, so what happens first? Photography uh, coincides with the sculpture or how does, uh, no, it's just a part of the entire journey. Well, right, I think, uh, as a sculptor, I had to learn how to communicate three-dimensional objects right. because we all see everyone's work in magazines and flat. It's barely you experience all the work in real time. So as a sculptor, I had to figure out how to communicate through two-dimensional. Okay. And so with photography, I got involved with that and, and through photographing my work, it actually makes you look at your work harder mm. and you learn from that process okay. and it's also how important light is with material and that in fact the material is shaping the light and and so I'm very interested in that as well. Interesting. Yeah. Material yeah. is shaping the light. Yeah. Okay, if you could talk a little <laughs> about that, if you could give well, a few instances from your work, that's a new one. We um, always think of um, the light yes, shape, well, the, the, the work or the but object. It's, but actually, the light hits the material, and it's the material that dictates what it, you see. <laughs> because if light is on, on this glass, that's right. It's the material tells you something different than when it's hitting this material. You know, right. So this material affects how we understand this material, material through the reflected light or... Okay. And so what comes first for you? The material always? Or the idea first? Uh, you know, it's a... I, I think it's a combination, really. And, and it's an evolution of working and one thing leading to the next. Because right. there are uh, aspects of my work that are generated through the making. If I wasn't making the work, the work, the idea wouldn't have come to me. So it's through working and seeing things happen, and then then maybe magnifying that moment in in, the, in another work. Okay. Um, another aspect of my work, I work with chain link fence. It's a a, a rugged industrial fabric, and that started because I. Uh, I, I bought a studio, but it was a warehouse that had a lot of materials in it, and I was moving the chain link, okay. and it got away from me, and it went out into space and, and fanned out and held a form. And I thought, well, how, it's a loose material, but it also has a, a, a grain or structure. So then I just kind of put it away, and about three or four months later, I started working with it to see what I could make with this material. And, and it was difficult, it didn't have its own structure, so I had to figure out how to bring structure to, the, to it. And, um, and through that process, um, I reflected on basket making, okay. you know, because the basket has the, the uh, horizontal structure, the hoops that the things are woven right. into. That's so right. it gives it that structure. So I brought in minimal elements to then give it some kind of stability. And again, light became real important because when, li when light is projected onto these things, there, there's a moray pattern that comes out. And 
when people see these objects from a distance, they don't know what it is they're looking at because it almost looks like glass really? because of the reflection and, and the, the lack of materiality. So, and then um, through that process, so a very different kind of work. And, and what I've found with the chain link stuff, when I took it outside, uh, they became monitors of the environment. So you would look through these objects and it would frame what was behind. Okay. And in fact, compress space and almost as if it came inside the object. I understand. So um, that parallels the casting. So the casting is maybe more earthbound and heavy uh, and, and bringing objects from nature inside and then the chain link is going outside in nature and and looking at it in a different way and then these two parallels have come together mm -hmm. and in fact my most recent work has both uh, castings and chain link and uh, an added element of video because inside i felt that the sterile light didn't bring the energy of that you see out in nature when you're interacting with a chain link. So the, the videos are images of natural events like turbulent water or something, and then that interacts with the chain link. And it must be giving a completely different uh, feel and yeah. impression uh, to that, the video. And, it, and in fact, the um, chain link uh, abstracts the video into energy because you don't see the image, you see the patterning and the energy of the water, but you don't really know it's water. So it looks like aurora borealis, you know, like the right. uh, like electricity. It creates movement, uh, John, yes. uh, in, yes. in the work as well. Yes, that that's part of it. Is that it, th so? It's not static. It's not static, exactly, yeah. exactly. And and so, as an artist, do you uh, do you have to do a lot of changes when you? Um, do works uh, for parks or for open spaces and when you work uh, for exhibitions which will be of course uh, inside galleries is is there a shift in um, ideology um, well there is material uh, does it require a lot of transformation not a lot but there is there is a an element of permanence and impermanence and fragility um, the uh, chain link is actually rather fragile, uh, even though it's a very industrial material, but the way I work with it, it's just on the edge of being a structure. And one of the problems is people get excited. <laughs> 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 they like to <laughs> jump or grab onto it or try to figure out what they are. <laughs> and so that part of it, it is a little bit of a hazard, but when you go outside, the scale is much different. And, and I'm interested in um, not just placing the work in the environment, but choosing the environment and having the environment interact with the work um, instead of just, you know, placing it somewhere. Okay. Um, and in the gallery, uh, it really depends if it's, a, if it's a more of a museum show. Uh, the, you work the pieces together where it becomes almost one installation you know, where it's not just single pieces, but there's a set up a rapport between the different objects. Okay. And, uh, I, and they become, I guess, more than their singular presence. Okay, interesting. A lot of sculptors also uh, worry about the permanence of a sculpture, like um, a few mentioned how steel mm -hmm. is a material they like to work a lot in because it's, um, as you mentioned, not as fragile and not as, uh, and it stands the test of time. So do you also worry about uh, these things as a sculptor, uh, that it has to have a certain amount of permanence or a certain amount of... Uh not really. I mm. mean, uh, when it really depends on the material and the object and, you know, okay. when it's outside, uh, the the cast the casting certainly are more durable but right. they will change through time change you know time. oxidation and things You're which right. i encourage or I'm, I'm interested in so that uh the piece will rust more or if they're done in bronze or aluminum 
they'll change over time and, and build a, a different kind of character, which interests me, that it's not kept polished or yeah. frozen in, in time, in but time. It, it becomes more integrated in the environment. With the environment, okay. So, so um, does your um, deep uh, connection with the natural materials and the environment stem from uh, your childhood uh, in uh, the desert? And uh, also, adding to that, um, you were talking about the lightning series where you picked up. Uh, so any more series that you could talk about, which also, uh, where you discovered a lot of natural. Well, in, in comparison to the lightning strike, I've also been working with glacier boulders as an object, to, as a symbol of time and endurance. Okay. Uh, with the lightning strike, it's a piece of wood hit by lightning, and it happens in a moment. Uh, and with the glacier boulder, it happens over thousands and millions of years. Right. You have a boulder that has to first become a boulder, <laughs> and then it's ice and water, uh, and then it becomes this soft object. And many times they're moved from where they originated. They've okay. been moved. Uh, thousands of miles away from where they were. Um, so I take those and I make castings in uh, different materials. So when you see an arrangement, there may be five rocks. One will be the original, one will be aluminum, bronze, copper, iron. And mm -hmm. at first glance, you think, oh, there's five rocks. Yes. But then you say, wait a minute, they're all the same. And then you start looking closer. And it's the idea of getting you to kind of, your perceptions to be heightened and see the subtleties and differences. So each metal has its own language and history, you know, iron all through the ages. Um, and each has its own visual weight. True. So when you're looking at aluminum, it looks, you've taken the boulder and made it into a, like a balloon. You think it's going to float, and, but the iron is very held to the ground. So those kinds of things happen as you're looking at it. And I also will arrange them so that they're not all in, sometimes I'll arrange them all in a line, but sometimes I'll arrange them randomly. And it's so that you'll see um, the boulder all at once. It's almost like a cubistic idea. Okay because they're all rotated, you're yes. seeing all, uh, at one time you see all the sides. Interesting. <laughs> kind of right, right. Uh, and then I bring those two, the lightning strikes and the boulders together, in a context of time. One made instantly in one millions of years. And, and the contrast. And yeah, mm. and then, but then they've been brought together with similar materials, frozen with casting. Mm. Interesting. So, do you experiment uh, with a lot of materials, uh, John, over the years? How has how has uh, this worked for you, in terms of materials? I've uh, I have I've um, also worked in mud. <laughs> Just uh, I was uh, asked to participate in a drawing exhibition, so I brought uh, two tons of mud <laughs> into the gallery and made this simple a gesture and then throughout the exhibition it evaporated okay and it, but in the center it was about this thick and on the outside it was this thick so it was like a, a dish mm -hmm. and so it would it dried from the inside out okay and cracked and so uh, through the exhibition people experienced this transformation of the world um, but i've always been interested in, in technology and um try to keep up with different processes and have done some uh, 3D rapid prototyping where you, the com you work in the computer uh, to build a 3D file okay. and then that goes to a machine that prints it out in 3D. Okay. okay. And it's a kind of an interesting extension of the casting. Okay. So you uh, do it uh, with your sculptures. You try and put it all together. The well, I worked a little differently because okay. in a computer, there's no gravity. <laughs> so you can think differently yes. and uh, it's very differently. And so I think about 
celestial objects. Yes. There's gravity out there, but you think of it all suspended, like what's in suspension. So I've done a little series on uh, like the moon of Mars and asteroids and things like that, and I've taken them and uh, captured their image and then reversed them and brought them together. Interesting. So video, photography, computer, so ah, you just keep um, changing. It, it's a, there's kind of a richening. It's, it's an interesting process of taking kind of your core thoughts and interests right. and take them to different materials right. or different, different ways of interpreting. Um, at maybe first glance you might think, your work's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but when you s sit down and start looking at it and you see that there's a core of uh, interest and pursuit, I think. So when you, when you begin a work, um, do you always uh, have it in mind that this is the idea, this is the material, this is how it's going to shape, or no? For example, uh, you may say, no, okay, I'm going to add some graphics to it, or no, this work probably needs some photographs as well. Does it happen along the way, or any series where you have discovered a brand new meaning to the entire concept with which you began with in the first place? Well, yeah, I mean, it's more of like having a concept and the journey yes. of making and and being surprised at the end. You know, <laughs> so, I mean that's it's more. Of a, I'm working on a series right now of vines. There are these vines that uh, choke the landscape. Oh yes, they're um, invasive, yes. and um, and they're all along the highways. So I started. Uh, cutting some of them, bring them into my studio. They're probably 25, 30 feet long, okay. but they're, they're like a drawing in space. Mm. And uh, I just went, for that's a really good example, I just went and got them. I didn't know what I was gonna do with them, but I felt I needed them. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm now working in the studio, making a three-dimensional drawing with the vines. Okay. And, uh, and I'm not sure how it's gonna end up. No. And that may have a video projection okay. in it. And I'm not sure what the subject of the video will be either. And that will be through testing. Okay. Yeah. okay. So sometimes you have to interact with the work for very long to probably complete it as an artist. And, uh, and in fact, sometimes just have it sitting around. <laughs> you know, it just kind of at the peripheral vision, you know, it's there waiting, mm. you know, and, and there's no pressure. <laughs> yes. uh, and then if I feel uh, that something has to happen, I'll go over and work with it. Okay, okay. Uh, John, you're also teaching. Uh, so tell us a little about uh, how teaching and uh, creating complement each other and what what is the new art scene in your country and uh, tell us a little about uh, your experiences there with working with other artists and your own students as well and what's happening in the sculpture <laughs> world out there. <laughs> I know, <laughs> there are too many questions at the same time. Okay, uh, you as a teacher first. <laughs> um, well, I'm f I've been teaching at the University of Maryland since 1987 and uh, it's the University of Maryland, I'm at their flagship campus. So it's a research institution and they, uh, hold the faculty uh, to teach, be part of, uh, be a citizen in terms of r helping to run the pr program, but also to be active professionally. And so they really encourage that. And um, it's unique to have a job where you, part of your job is to be in the studio working. And uh, it's a great support. Yes. And, and in that way, I'm not all the time um, dependent on sales. I can make work that I'd want to make and not dictated by uh, the market or by a gallery, uh, but what I need to make. And um, there's small grants and things like that that support me. So that's been great. And then uh, paralleling that, I'm teaching and and I really enjoy teaching uh, and to see, you know, because I give the students problems and 
to watch them work through those problems and and in some cases I learn new things by seeing how a fresh perspective is uh, emerges and so I've I guess some faculty say they don't learn from their students but I feel that if that's the case maybe they've stopped <laughs> learning from from anything I think uh, so and it it can it can be dangerous in an academic environment where you become complacent. You know, you've got the job, it's great, and uh, and you've got working with students, and sometimes that energy that that you put into teaching can draw from your creative energy. And I'm just always conscious of not letting that happen. You know, okay. to kind of keep them parallel and in in balance. Right. Um, and for example, um, I was able to come here. <laughs> We're in the middle of the semester, and uh, but uh, the sport was there for me to come and be part of the conclave and uh, see a little bit of India. Yes, uh, yes. And how do you look at uh, sharing experiences with other artists is concerned? For example, in India we now have started having some art fairs and a uh, lot of uh, activities which also uh, symposiums as well as uh, seminars which get artists from different fields together. For example, this uh, international enclave which is of course the first of its kind that we have here. So how do you perceive that? How is it important for you as an artist also to look at the world outside and uh, draw from it as well? How does it work for you as an artist? I, I've um, been I think throughout my career I've always been interested in, in other cultures and, and what's going on in their art scene and it's actually been through my art or being involved in art that I've been able to travel and to, and to, to in fact participate in activities like this. I felt that um, student other f artists also come and bring bring their culture and their interests, and it really is a very, um, I guess, inspiring experience because we, we all are coming from different places. We all have a common interest, and the energy can be very good. And um, and you learn about not only the country that you're in, but because it's an international gathering, you also learn a bit from the other countries. And I think the the um, the art fair has become a big deal now internationally as well. And I know in the United States, it's become the way to um, sell artwork. I have a gallery in Baltimore, and um, he finally just started going to art fairs. And it's great because he also takes my work outside okay. of Baltimore, and it's great exposure for both the artist and the gallery. And it's, and it's really become kind of the market. At first, you would think that it was kind of tacky, like an art fair. <laughs> 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 but it's actually become the way uh, that the world is working right now in, in the art scene. And, it's, and I hadn't realized that uh, India has started. Yes, right? we, we've just uh, a few years now, but it's really picked up and uh, it also uh, encourages a lot of um, audience as well as artist interaction, which was earlier missing because uh, right. artworks were only limited to galleries and the museum. Yes, and, right. it and there was you were intimidated sometimes by mm. the artist or the artwork. Right. So this probably allows uh, more free flow. That's uh, right. Of um, you probably telling us about your work and we probably asking you about it. So like a communication yeah and uh, mm, what about the we talked a lot about uh, the concept of time and nature or the natural in your work what about the human element where does that draw in in your work is it I guess it, the the it is the the human element is maybe the scale and the and creating a, a situation that would encourage someone to be, to inquire or to engage 
in that way. Um, because I mean, the work is just sitting there, yeah. <laughs> and um, and hopefully, the through the interaction with other people, there'll there'll be that engagement. I also do learn from that process, uh, maybe conversations afterwards, or just watching people interact with the work. Um, but that's really as far as it goes. Also. Some of the more recent work has been in reference to some of the disasters, natural disasters that have been happening, like tsunamis, and where um, there's a collision of culture and nature, and some of the imagery that's been generated from that. Um, that's about okay. it. <laughs> For instance, uh, if you could talk a little about these works, uh, share with us. Uh, there's a, a, a piece I finished. It's called Sunken Grid, and it's a um, it's a it's an architectural kind of simple uh, form that looks like a wedge, but it's it actually looks like as if it is a rectangle sunk in the in the floor, but it's so it's cut off so and, and tilted. So it's, so it infers that. It continues underneath, okay. so that it's been buried, and then there's a lightning strike uh, that's brought onto it in a casual way, as if it had been washed onto it. Right. Um, and then it has then the whole installation has a projection of koi fish, mm. <laughs> so the, nice. this energy of. Uh, the koi fish projected on on this whole situation, and and again the the wire structure becomes this three dimensional canvas to interact with the koi fish, okay. and uh, and it then it it's on a timer so that there are three conditions of light where there's just light and then kind of half light, half projection, and then just projection. So it kind of phases through different perceptions. Okay, and creates that. Yeah. Okay. And um, what about photography that keeps, uh, is it a parallel that keeps going on? And anything new that you're doing these days? Well, a few years ago I w went to Iceland. I've always wanted to go to Iceland because of its uh, Kind of volcanic activity and sparse population, uh, but a very uh, like a living landscape. There's volcanoes going off all the time. There's glaciers. There's water. When a volcano goes off, it will melt the the cap of the, of the glacier and cause these amaz amazing floods. So there's always this transition and transaction going on and. Um, I finally got a, went to a residency over there and spent a month going through the landscape and doing this photography that I had mentioned that where I, in fact, that was the beginning of my composite photography where I was very interested in the, the way the landscape was shaped and formed and then started. And when you take a camera and look at that, there just wasn't enough information with one photograph, so I started to build, and these images end up being not rectangular because you're building it, so the image is dictated by the, the shapes of the landscape okay. that I'm looking at. Okay. Um, so that started a whole series of photographs and ways of working with a camera that has evolved um, to now I'm doing some photographs that are about 10 feet tall and narrow, like a doorway. Okay. So you, it's to encourage you to almost walk into the space, okay. where typically a, a, a photograph you look at as a window. That's right. And this is more of a door. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's, and it, again, it has a more physical materiality to it. So where, what is this series about? Um, this one is where I stand, I'll stand and, and photograph where my feet are, 
and then build an image to what's over my head. And so it's, a, it's an odd perspective because in a f one photograph you would, could not do that. Mm -hmm. And so it, it warps the space. If you really try to analyze the photograph, it's not right as a, but it, it's more about that experience. And, and not trying to depict a picture so much, but, but a, an experience and a relationship with that experience to how the camera works and, uh, and what the different process is. And also with the stitching software, the way I work with the camera, it confuses the software. So the software does some mistakes and I keep the mistakes. It's like, letting the, the nature of that computer come out a little bit, that it has flaws. Mm. And so I leave the little flaws. Typically in photography, it's all about the pristine focus, perfect <laughs> photograph. <laughs> and so mine kind of mixes that a little bit. It, it almost becomes, I mean, people have compared them to painting than, okay. than photo photography. Okay. Okay. And does painting also happen alongside? The Not the with a brush. No. <laughs> it's more about color and uh, texture and light. All of the considerations that might a painter might consider, but it's in the photography. Okay. And what are you working on these days in uh, uh, installation or sculpture, uh, John? Um, well, I'm the these photographs I've just mentioned okay. are 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 coming together. Okay. This uh, Vine project okay. is, is coming together and um, I'm also, while I'm here, I'm going to travel down Rajasthan okay. and go to the desert there and maybe some photographs will be generated okay. from that. From and, that okay. and that's what also is exciting for me is that I can still make artwork when I travel. You know, as a sculptor, we're confined to the studio and equipment, and I have a forklift and a crane truck and all that You're stuff. Right. You're right. But, but, and then when I travel, it's great that I'm able to still continue the creative process and uh, use the camera as a way to. Which later can be probably turned into uh, sculpture pieces as well, the photographs. Well, they can, uh, yeah, though, uh, can. Uh, certainly um, affect or okay. maybe the aesthetic yes. of, of, of the sculpture. I probably wouldn't do a sculpture of a desert, <laughs> but, but there's True. certain, certain elements, yeah, you, aspects of yes. it that would come into the work. That's yeah. right, that's right. Yeah. And um, so as a teacher, what do you see? Um, uh, you studied at an art school as well, and now you're teaching at uh, an art school. So what, what is the kind of difference that you observe uh, when it comes to uh, the younger generation of artists or the new generation of artists as compared to our times or your times? Well, it's an interesting, I don't, I've talked to other faculty about this, but I kind of feel that this generation or the right now that's in school has a lack of empathy they, they don't, and, and we talked about it, trying to figure out what is it, it what it, they don't seem to know how to uh, imagine themselves as like a glass of water, I mean, what that would be. <laughs> they it just they would look at you, kind of, well, what do you mean by that? Um, and w I think it comes from maybe them not having time growing up. They All their time has been Scheduled, yes. soccer practice, ballet, this, that, yes. and and kind of manage. I guess they go helicopter <laughs> moms, or whatever, <laughs> where they've been managed the whole time, and they haven't had the chance to just be, you know, go out and play or go and and to inquire, you know, have this inquiry into the world and things. I think there's a little bit of that missing, and I guess it also the discussion about computers and being insular and ex all their experiences happening within the computer. And, um, and that can kind of remove a sense of materiality or tactileness, mm -hmm. you know, because it's all 
inside the computer. However, there's certainly an aesthetic inside the computer, and it's different. Yes. <laughs> um, so, th I mean, that's one of the biggest differences, I think, okay. that I've noticed in terms of the relationship of how, the, as they're growing up, right. the amount of time they've been able to spend not managed. You know. <laughs> And does it translate into their work as well? Yeah, uh, well, but, you know, at the end, they do fine, you okay. know, and you, and you just kind of work with that. It's just a difference in, in what you have to work with, and then, and then they do well. Right. So do you travel a lot uh, to discover um, more experiences for work, uh, Rupert, or do they now, how does, how does the mind of an artist work? In your case, is it travel? Is it just experiencing? You said sometimes just being is important. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. How um, do you work if you were to tell us how does? Well, I think uh, it, it's really you. It just comes, you know. And and like I was saying with it, like with the finds or with the photography, there's there's a an interest to make and to do and so it isn't really c contemplated I don't no. think and, okay. um, and there's just this urge to get in and work and 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 there'll be certain things that I'll say well, I need to get after this and work it through but then for example like traveling here I'm not sure what's gonna manifest from this mm. but I'm sure something will happen there'll be some influence from being here. Okay. Um, okay. But there is constant work. That's that's something that you're uh, constantly doing. Right. Yeah, there is... Uh, th is there a constant flow? Or do you also, like, sometimes us have writer's blocks or artist's well, blocks? <laughs> well, there certainly is, is that kind of rhythm, you know. You, there's certainly during the academic cycle, you know, your, your focus and your energies are put into another direction. Um, and so that can kind of slow you down or take you off track. And typically it's the breaks between semesters where you kind of retool and, and get something done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anything that you really feel that you need to create and which still hasn't been done, any, any dream project or any dream uh, that you feel that yes this is something that has been on my mind but still hasn't been translated well actually uh, i have a commissioned piece in a, in an airport in baltimore and it was done back in 96 7 back in the late 90s well uh it's a chain link sculpture and it's not lit very well and so i've uh, been talking with the administration there and we've come up with an interesting uh, LED lighting system to light the sculpture that was not available back then. back then. So now it's kind of going back into a work that was made, you know, 16 years ago or something and then revitalizing it with this new technology and actually creating a new work. Okay. from it and it um, it's going to be interesting and because the light itself will be like an animation True. where you can time it and change and make transitions of color and we're using um, I felt that bringing color would be arbitrary but the idea it, the sculpture is located at the end of the airport where there's a lot of glass okay. and you can see the sunset. So we're using the transition of light at sunset as a structure to design how the light will change in the piece. Okay. So it's probably the most on my mind right now. It'd be interesting to see that. Yes, and yeah. that means probably reworking a lot of uh, things, uh, how they are perceived also with the light. Well, r we did a mock-up in the in the airport. We okay. actually went in there and hung some lights. And people that have been working in the ha in the airport for years said, "When did the sculpture come here?" 
they never notice. I mean, it's a huge sculpture. It's, uh, it's uh, 40 feet in diameter, and <laughs> hanging in the air, <laughs> and they never noticed it because the lighting wasn't there. So that's so. where light, which yeah. you focus so much upon, right. comes in. Thank you, John. It was wonderful speaking well, to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure.